Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special limited series brought to you by the Falcons Podcast Network. I am Tori McElhaney, and I am joined by a man who needs no introduction, but I've written one nonetheless. Um, this is someone who has almost 50 years of coaching experience at both the high school level, the college level, the pro level. Um, he has a coaching tree of, we recently found out, about 25 coaches deep at the college and pro level, two Super Bowl championships, retired in 2019, but couldn't keep him away from the field, and he came back as the defensive coordinator of the Falcons in 2021. I am joined by none other than Dean Pease. Thank you for joining me on the podcast now. Before we actually get into the content that I have prepped for the podcast, I wanted to tell you a story because this is a very funny story. I don't know if you remember or not, but this was a press conference. Gosh, it was probably midway through the season last year. And you said that I was your favorite, which <laughs> I appreciated nonetheless. But one of our podcast listeners actually sent me in the mail a very special gift. And I'm going to show it to you. It's a, <laughs> That's great. It's That's a mug great. that says Dean's favorite. I'm going to show the camera. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and this is something that it was funny because I got a text from Austin Hiddle, who's our director of video here. And he was like, Tori, there's something in the office that got sent to you. And I was like, who is sending me anything? My parents definitely wouldn't. The only people who send me things are my parents. I was like, there's no way that anyone's going to send me something. He was like, I don't know what it is, but it's here at the facility. And this is what it was. That's very nice. It was a very, I was like, this is very thoughtful. So I had to show it to you. So now I'm officially Dean's favorite. It's, it's, <laughs> yes, been, you are. it's been in the mug form. So my plan for this podcast is kind of just to go through your 50 years of coaching and kind of look at it in a chronological way and, and look back at the lessons learned and the moments that you find meaningful and appreciate um now something that we actually talked about recently is that you got your start as a high school football mm -hmm. coach and teacher and that's something that's very near and dear to my heart because my dad is a high school football coach and teacher so I don't know if many people actually know that about you I think they see like oh he's a defensive coordinator in the professional league but he got his start as a high school coach that's very interesting so for you I want to go back to it's probably what 1972 1973 yeah, 1973 1973 go take me back to a young Dean Pease well I had just graduated from college really in the middle of the year I graduated in December I was playing in a city league basketball league and the guy that was on my team was the principal of a high school and uh, obviously I got to know him well playing on the team and one day he came to me and goes uh, you know what are you planning on doing? I was actually working at a men's clothing store uh, in town, and uh, I said, well, you know, I want to teach and coach. I, said, I got an education degree. I really want to coach. And so he goes, well, I think we're going to have an opening. Would you be interested? Absolutely. So I, I took the job sight unseen, didn't know where the high school was, <laughs> anything else, didn't really care, just so I wanted the job. And uh, took the job and was uh, – the defensive coordinator my first year and then the next year the, the head coach resigned and I became the head coach and really that's really Tori that's that was kind of what I wanted to be I wanted to be the guys I admired the most kind of growing up besides my father was my high school coaches and so I kind of wanted to follow in their footsteps so I was happy and I stayed on there for six years Wow, I think that's I, I love that because I, I for me the backbone I think of coaching is teaching, and I know that's something that you've talked about before. When you were kind of at the high school level, how how did you see that incorporating not only in what you were doing then, but who you are now as a defensive coordinator in the league? Well, I think there's a couple of things that came really from the very early beginning there in high school. Is number one. Um, you know, you had to prepare lesson plans. You had to prepare ahead. Uh, everybody doesn't learn at the same rate. You know, I think your object as a teacher was not to see how many people you could fail. It's how many can you benefit to really understand the stuff that you're trying to teach and uh, get the most out of them. 
And so everybody is at a different level, and so you got to learn how to deal with that, and you got to have patience because, every, like I say, everybody's not going to just come natural to them. And really, that's even true in the NFL. Every, every defensive back doesn't play at the same level. Some catch on real quick, some maybe not so much so, but it's your job to get them to all be at the same level. So how are you going to do that? I think the other thing is that um, in high school, you inherit who you have. You don't recruit. You know, it's not like college, okay, we can go out and recruit this guy or we can draft this guy in the NFL. Hey, I got whoever I got. That guy's got to go play my free safety. He's got to go play linebacker for me. I got to figure out how the parts fit. Now, what, what can this guy do best? How can we fit him into this? And I think that's how you become a successful high school coach. You deal with so many personalities. You deal with parents. <laughs> you deal with all that kind of stuff that's kind of from the outside in. But I think it really – helps you to become a teacher and it and you also have to stand in front of a classroom all the time and you're you're talking and teaching it's not take something off a computer and you know like nowadays a little bit more than than i think it should be is too many guys spend too much time on the computer and not enough time with people you had to teach and i think that that's i'm really really grateful for the way that i i did come up um, it didn't take over. You know, it didn't happen overnight, but I really am thankful for the way it did, and I really am just so grateful that I was a high school teacher to start out with. What are kind of some of the the stories that you have from being a high school coach and teacher? I know uh, I think back to what my dad did growing up. You're mowing the field. You are trading film. You are doing it's kind of you're doing everything you know now it's like oh these coaching staffs at the pro level they have underlings who can do everything but at the high school level it is you doing everything so what was what was kind of your week like as a high school coach well it was in the summer I mowed the fields lined the fields Uh, that's kind of what you did we put on a camp every summer but it was free we got some of the mothers of the players to, you know, make snacks and drinks and all that stuff. And and that, that's how you, you really got going. You weren't in it. It didn't have anything to do with money because there wasn't <laughs> there any. There wasn't money. <laughs> there wasn't any. Uh, so it's, it's, it was just, it was very, very, when you look back on it, it's just so rewarding. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, you don't know how good your childhood is until you become an adult. Totally. Well, I think it was the same way in coaching. I, I don't know how much fun and how much I actually enjoyed being a high school coach until I became a coach later on and how much I appreciated what I had to do and what other coaches have to do. That's why I admire high school coaches. We need more of them. Uh, I really feel like in society we're always trying to find oh all these psychological things to help kids that – you know, there's just way too many shootings and things like that going on nowadays. How about if all the kids in the high school or 80% of them were involved in an extracurricular activity after school? And it doesn't have to be football. It could be any sport. It could be music. It could be plays. It could be any of that stuff. How much more beneficial would that be to maybe put money into the high schools in this country than it would into all these other programs you know, so they aren't going on home and sitting around and being alone or playing, you know, on on some of these games that they play on video games. How about if we could get kids more involved? Well, you, you got people right there in the high school that will do it, but they also, you shouldn't have to do it for free. Right. And so, you know, maybe we ought to some pump some money in that way. I know I'm talking politics <laughs> there a little bit, but I just really feel like sometimes that that's all kind of gone by the – wayside and there's programs being dropped because they say well we don't have the money to support uh, this program or that program Uh, i just think that's a tragedy yeah i i think too like you, you talk about you know people being alone being in i think growing up always being around a team and being a part of a team that was something that really kind of shaped me into who i am and i know it's something that shapes even the players at the professional level into who they are as being a part of a team. What are kind of some memories that you have of, of those early days and in, in kind of forming these teams? And, and you were talking about how at the high school level, you don't get to bring in who you want to. You have these guys who you just kind of have. What was kind of your way of, of building 
these teams? Well, I think the the biggest thing was is I we I took over a program that had not won in a long time. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing was kind of being positive and trying to convince them that they can be good. Um, there's so much more of that than people really realize at all levels. Yeah. You know, you you become in a rut if if you just aren't having a lot of success. People have a tendency to kind of drop down to the level that everybody puts them at instead of trying to go past that. Uh, but, you know, also being at the high school, uh, I was the head football coach, I was the JV basketball coach, and the head track coach. And so the other part of that is not everybody that ran track played football. Right. Not everybody that played football ran track, or then there were certain guys in basketball, that was their thing. So you also find out that everybody doesn't have the same interest you do, you know, and that's okay. You know, but they, so you coach them all different. You know, I can't go in, you know, as, as a um, basketball coach and treat it like I did as the football team, mm -hmm. you know, you know, giving them a rah-rah speech before, <laughs> you know, to go out and hit somebody <laughs> was, was not, not going to work, <laughs> not, not real good when they fouled out. So then, and then after a couple of years as a basketball coach, they asked me if I wanted to be the assistant wrestling coach. Well, I'd never wrestled in my life. I didn't know anything about it, but yeah. I thought, you know, it'd be interesting. So I did it. And. Basically, they let me go as a basketball coach because I got too many technicals. So <laughs> they moved me over to wrestling. And so then I became the assistant wrestling coach. Like I say, didn't know anything about it. But then I get a whole different appreciation for what those guys go through. You're out there on the mat by yourself. You're not playing on a team. It's you and against the other guy. And there's nobody you can ask for help. You know, you're not calling for the safety or the linebacker to help you out. There's It's you. And so – different appreciation for that same thing with the track guys mm -hmm. it's you against the clock and against the other guys so you learn a lot about people and how to handle people and to me that was the most rewarding thing about high school and then you know everybody always talks to me about the super bowls and stuff but the truth of it is is that the satisfaction of watching that high school team have their first winning season mm. in 20 years was very very rewarding yeah it took a lot of work had nothing to do with money the assistant coaches that were on my staff i mean those guys got peanuts to help be an assistant coach yeah. maybe five hundred dollars for the oh, year yeah. mm -hmm. and just the you know just the the great satisfaction of taking a, a group like that that hadn't won and watching them win was just really really satisfying yeah I, I i love that because it is i mean i i think a lot of people get it don't get into coaching for the money they get into it because they love people and love their players um and i i think that shows most evident in the fact that you got so many technicals as a basketball coach i have a story yeah so when i was 13 years old i was at my sister my younger sister's basketball game it was just like a rec game it wasn't anything significant and i got a technical in the stands not because I was technically yelling, but because I was sitting beside my mom and we both were yelling and she yelled to this this poor young referee that he sucked and I was like, yeah, he does. And then he turned around and said, get out of here. So <laughs> I can relate to that. What is your favorite tech getting a technical story that you ever had? Well, actually, it's the first game I ever coached as a JV <laughs> the coach. first one. And, and the head coach... The varsity coach was our athletic director, okay. who obviously, you know, was my boss. Right. Not twice, not only as the basketball coach, but as the AD. And so we're at an away game, and I don't remember, there's some call goes on, but I do remember it was Gibsonburg High School. <laughs> and, you know, it's different than in football. I walked right out to midcourt and started getting the <laughs> officials. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're not supposed to be out here. It was the no. first thing he told me. And then the second thing was he give me a technical and then I kind of looked around and there's our athletic director shaking his head going what have I done <laughs> and so that was I, I do remember my very first technical as well, a coach yeah you never you never forget I, I love that <laughs> it was well, funny too because yeah the coaching basketball and coaching football it's a, it's a very different beast and I, I liked what you were talking about in terms of like having to choose and understand how each not only like each team works, but e coaching and teaching each individual person. Right. Um, you've had a 
almost 50 years of doing this, is there a, a player who learned in a different way that you kind of had to go back and be like, I need to figure out how this this player learns because it, it, it's very different than maybe somebody else. Well, I don't, I don't know if I could say, and I probably wouldn't say who it <laughs> was, but um, every player learns a little different. Right. And, and some can just look at the film and boom, pick it up. Some of them you can actually draw a diagram and they can pick it up. Some of them you got to go out there and rep it two or three times mm -hmm. before they truly understand. It doesn't matter. Bottom line is, how do I need to get it taught? You know, everybody doesn't probably learn math quite the same way oh, yeah, or, no. you know, or anything else. And uh, even if some people can read a book and tell you everything that's in the book, me, I got to go back and back and back <laughs> and back and write notes and do all that kind of stuff. So everybody does learn differently. But I think the other part of it is that everybody comes from a different background too. Mm -hmm. And the more you know about their background, as a teacher or as a coach. Uh, this is kind of fast forwarding a little bit, but in college, I wanted as a head college coach, I wanted to visit every player that played for me's home, which is hard to do It's in a lot college. of players, yeah. But I did it every spring. Uh, when most of the coaches would go junior recruiting, mm -hmm. I went and visited the homes of guys who were already on my team because it helped me understand, is it a tough background? Right. Is it a very affluent background? Is it a very poor background financially? Mm -hmm. Who runs the family? Is it mom, is it dad, is it grandma? Are there, is there a dad in the picture? Mm -hmm. Is there parents in the picture? If you understand those dynamics, you also maybe understand a little bit about the player right. a little bit more. And to me, that was really, really important. It was easy to do when you're recruiting a kid out of high school because you're going on the home visits and you get to kind of see. But you don't know about the guys that are already were on your team. And then eventually you know them all because you've recruited them all if you're there long enough. And it it, it transcends into the NFL. Oh, really? Be, because I'll give you an example of a young man one time that we're playing in a playoff game. And Every Wednesday, uh, as long as I've been a coordinator in the NFL, I have what I call a signal callers meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I take a guy from each position, and we come in, and I talk to them about, here's before I ever talk to the defense, here's what our game plan is. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. So they have a little input into it because it's, it's their team. Right. And so, like, like when I was in Baltimore, I mean, it was Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Terrell Suggs, and Haloti Nada. I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. You know, I, was a, I should have taken a picture. <laughs> so I can remember walking into them one time and telling them, here's what, you know, we want to do against this team that we're playing in the playoffs. So, I mean, this is big, big now. Yeah. This is a, we, we can't be wrong. Right. All right. So then I tell them that, and, and I, I'll never forget Ed Reed's face, is that I tell him that um, I'm going to put this one corner in charge of making the disguise call. Mm. Okay, we're going to try to disguise the coverage on this quarterback, and I want everybody to look the same. And the kid that I talked about was a kid that always had, had come from a couple different teams and had, had trouble adjusting and just kind of was – just had trouble. Yeah. And so Ed looked at me like, you're going to do what? <laughs> I said, I am. Yeah. Because here's the thing about it is he's never been in charge of anything. Nobody's ever given him that responsibility. He's always been put in a follower role. Somebody else is in charge, and you have to do what they do. The truth of the matter is, is I don't really care what we disguise. It's just I want them both corners to be exactly the same. So I know this corner over here is going to do exactly what I tell him to do. Mm -hmm. Him, the guy that I'm talking about, sometimes does, sometimes <laughs> he doesn't. But if he's in charge, I know the other guy will do exactly. Mm. I said, and I'm going to point it out in front of the whole defense who I'm going to put in charge of the disguise. I said, and wait till you see his face. I will bet you that he perks right up, sits up, and all of a sudden, like, somebody gave me some credibility mm. and some responsibility because I knew about this kid's background and it wasn't good right 
And so when I did that that day, Ed comes back to me and goes, man, you were right. I turned around and looked at him, and it was like somebody had just given him something special. Yeah. And you're in charge. And he took that and ran with it and had a heck of a year, had a heck of a game. And we won it and went on to the Super Bowl. So it was just something like that. But that not – if I hadn't known his background, if I just would have said, well, hey, I'm not going to put that guy in charge. I'm going to put this guy in right. charge. It benefited him, but it benefited us. And, it, and the only reason I kind of did it was because I knew that he needed that mm. and that would help all of us. And it did. Yeah. I mean, that was what I was going to ask is like – why that moment like why did you want to give him that responsibility i mean you talk about it's a big game it's a playoff game like this is this is it It, it, you win or you or you lose and that's it and and so why was it that moment that you felt compelled to do because it fit Mm. because i like i say it didn't matter what the disguise was Mm -hmm. i didn't care if they lined up in cover two and played cover three or if they lined up in cover three and played cover two it didn't matter what mattered was that we just had a disguise. I right. didn't want the quarterback to be able to, before the ball was ever snapped, to know exactly what the coverage was. So it didn't matter how we disguised it, it just mattered that we did. So it was a perfect timing to put him in charge of it because it didn't really, it wasn't, there wasn't anything schematically, he couldn't screw it up. Right. He couldn't. Yeah. So whatever he chose to do mm-hmm. was gonna be right. Mm-hmm. And it was just so the timing of it was, it just it, it happened. I just thought about it at the time, and I thought, okay, I got to put somebody in charge of this. And I thought it's the perfect time to put him in charge mm-hmm. of it. I I love that because I think that it's it, you go going back to what you're talking about is like knowing the background of a player, and kind of knowing how much they can handle versus what they can't handle. I, I think you even talked about it, even taking over this Falcons defense last year, and and you made the comment like. I'm not trying to fit the the players to the scheme. A good coach, a good coordinator fits the scheme to the players. And how much, like, when you're looking at, like, background and thinking about who you have available, how much do you cognizantly think about that and, and how much you as a coordinator are changing to fit the person that you have? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I, I would hope that all coaches would do that. It's the easiest analogy it was okay if you have an option quarterback that you hi- you recruited out of high school to to go in are you going to make him a drop back quarterback in college no <laughs> no there was a reason why he had success in high school because he was an option quarterback and can run mm-hmm. okay so you're going to adapt your off i would hope you, you probably most times you're recruiting guys to what you want to do if you're a drop back college team you're going to recruit a drop back guy right the thing that hit me was in the in the NFL, especially, you know, you only have 45 guys dressed on game day. Right. You know, maybe 22 guys on defense. So, you know, if a guy goes down, okay, let's say that we want to play man coverage. And we got corners, we got maybe two corners. Hey, if you're blessed, you have two corners that can play man coverage. But what if one of them gets hurt or rolls an ankle or does something like that, and the next guy up isn't a good man coverage team or guy? Mm-hmm. So... Are, are you going to say then, well, my guys, you're going to play man coverage no matter what? You're going to get killed. So w- the, the year we won the Super Bowl in Baltimore in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, we started seven different corners that year yep. because of injuries and things. Well, we changed the game plan every week. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we played a lot of cover two. Sometimes we played a lot of cover three. Sometimes we played a lot of cover man. And so... I mean, we we got it. We had a, we brought a kid in one day, day on a Tuesday, and was playing on. He was going to have to start on Sunday <laughs> against the team that just cut him. Oh goodness! Now, do you think they might know a little something about him? Absolutely. Well, bit. there's no way am I going to put him in harm. It's not fair to put him in harm's way and say, "Bye, guys. This is what you're going to yeah. have to do." We're going to. What does this guy? When we watch the film on him from the other team, what does he do best? Well, that's what we're going to end up having to do. I got to kind of configure it and do some things. And to me, that's what you do as a coach. Is it's just it's not fair to a player if he's not a good blitzer. Why would you be blitzing him? If he's not a good pass rusher, why would you mm-hmm. be putting him in a situation and then everybody's screaming at him like, why can't this guy do it? Well, you know, you're putting him in an unfair advantage. There's some things they just got to do because it's part of the defense, right. but. 
for the most part, you're trying your best to put guys in position so they can have success because that's how you're going to have success. Mm -hmm. Kind of going going back to, to what you were saying about going into players' homes and getting to know them, You after coaching at the high school level for six years, you made the jump to college, and you made many stops there. Miami, Ohio, Toledo, Michigan State, I could go on. Um, but for you, and, and then, the, of course, the head coaching job at, at Kent State, what were you like as a recruiter? I know recruiting now is very different, and it's almost like its own machine now. Yeah. But at the time, it's probably – 80s 90s mm -hmm. what was recruiting like at that time i liked it you did i, I did enjoy it. i didn't like to travel necessarily all the time but i actually liked going in and visiting with parents because i was a parent <laughs> and i wanted to make them feel like i'm going to treat their son like i would treat my son mm -hmm. you know i'm going to take care of him i'm going to i'm going to do everything i can to make sure he graduates from college that's going to be the number one thing i know he was going to play football and football is going to help pay the bill but his chances of playing in the NFL, you know, are slim. And so uh, I know that and a lot of guys that I recruited, it, they were the first person in their family to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so mom's looking at him going, I want this guy to get an education. And so therefore, as a father, I wanted to project that image that you're, I'm going to take care of your son. He's not going to be just a football player in my eyes. He's going to be a young man. And, and I'm going to take care of him. And I, I wanted to portray that. And, but I did enjoy it. Um, and I didn't – now you have to be a negotiator. Oh, yeah, 100%. And so the difference then was, though, that I sold the school, not me or even the football program. Mm, mm -hmm. Because coaches can change. Yeah. Okay, your son goes to Michigan State. If you come to Michigan State, you're coming to Michigan State – because it's got a good academic program that you're interested in. It's got a good football program and good people that are going to treat you right. Because two years from now, I'm working for Nick Saban. He, he was mentioned for every head coaching job there was in the country. Yeah. So everybody was always using recruiting against us, saying, well, you're going to go play for Saban. He's not even going to be there mm -hmm. next year. I go, yeah, he might not be. I didn't try to take the other approach, like, oh, no, he's going to be. I don't know. He might yeah. not be. Then I'd look like a liar. I said, yeah, he might not be. But if you're choosing Michigan State because of Nick Saban, you're choosing Michigan State for the wrong reason. You should be choosing Michigan State because of the academics that you can get, the school, the people, the overall atmosphere of Michigan State. If you're not, then, yeah, you shouldn't come to us. I don't know if I'll be there next year. Who knows? This yeah. is a coaching profession. People move. Mm -hmm. Don't pick a school because of a person. Pick up because of the school. I don't think that's the case anymore. <laughs> it's changed a lot that way. It's pretty crazy. So recruiting was different. Yeah. You know, and I'll go back even to, like in college, even at Kent State. You know, my wife every Thursday night we had ten players over to our house off the team. Mm. We spread it out over the course of you know ten games, and so but we had um, you know eighty five to ninety guys on the team. Every player that was on our football team had a home cooked meal in our house on Thursday night. And so they got to see my house and what it was like and where it was and all that stuff. And so it took a little more of a personal look than he's just the coach. And, you know, I'm probably a whole lot different at home than I was on the field. Mm -hmm. And so, and it just, I think just sharing that helps guys understand guys are always going to play harder for you if they know you care oh, about 100%. them mm -hmm. and so it's kind of that's how recruiting was to me it was get to know people more than it was just recruit somebody yeah what uh what y'all eat during those those visits to to your house uh, anything and everything or? yeah a little bit of everything bit of it everything? could be burgers it could be hot dogs it could be barbecue it could be a little bit of everything nice i didn't know if it was like we're gonna have this every single thursday night are you a superstitious type in terms of coaching not too much no. so i no. my dad was very superstitious and there was one time we had to eat i think it was subway it was like we had to have subway <laughs> and this is not a podcast sponsored by subway unless subway you want to sponsor the podcast <laughs> but we would eat subway every single like sunday night because they kept winning and it was like that was the thing i don't know why it was that that we fixated on but it was like we have to eat subway 
or we have to eat Pizza Hut. So what if you lost? Did you never eat Subway again? We, we didn't eat it for the rest of the season, <laughs> which was very unfortunate because I like a good sandwich. So, I mean, that's just how it was. Um, but, it, no, I, I love that, and I think that's – you're right, the players, and I think um, the impact that players – like coaches have on players' lives, they don't know who you are. They don't – there's no impact there. And I think that's super, super important. Um, so you, you talked about – uh, coaching with Nick Saban and in this area in the Atlanta Georgia area he is someone who's very very well known and his career is very very well known what's your favorite Nick Saban story from your time coaching with him oh I gotta be careful here <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so no he Nick treated me absolutely great and and I know people would think this is probably hard to believe but um in, in I was Nick Saban's defense coordinator twice. Right. Yes. You you were with him. He at... got the, he got a lot of people don't know he was the head coach at the University of Toledo. Right. And he was only there a year. Mm-hmm. And so I was hired. He hired me as his defense coordinator. Uh, we went nine and two, won the league, mm-hmm. and he leaves. <laughs> Bye, <laughs> and, Nick. <laughs> and goes and goes to the Browns as the defense coordinator, and here we are nine and two. But we all got retained and, and stayed on and uh, with a guy named Gary Pinkle, who was also a great coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then when Nick, I, I left on later and went to Notre Dame, and then Nick went to Michigan State and hired me back as his defensive coordinator. So Nick has always been great to me and my family. Mm-hmm. And I, people will find it's hard to believe, but in all the time that I coached for Nick, he never raised his voice one time at me, never. And I think he knew that I always had, was loyal, had mm-hmm. mutual respect for him, and would never do anything that, that he didn't want. But I do recall one time we're out and we have what we call pre-practice, and I go out and I kind of walk through and talk mm-hmm. through the stuff that's gonna go through in practice. And so I go out and I'm going through all this stuff with the defense, and he wasn't out there, and he kind of walked out late. Mm-hmm. And then he started to talk about something that I'd already covered. And I was in a hurry because I wanted to get everything done before the whistle blew to start practice. And I just looked at him and I goes, hey, I've covered that. Kind of that, like that. And as soon as I did it, I was like, oh, no. what the heck <laughs> have I done? And all the players got de- <laughs> like, oh, God. Dead, dead silence. <laughs> he didn't say a word. Mm. We went on, we practiced. Later that night, though, I got a telephone call. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and all, all it was was, next time I walk out late, I'd appreciate it very much if you didn't use that tone with me. Yes, sir. Like, you <laughs> yeah, got it. Don't worry. <laughs> you're good, Coach. I I knew I was wrong two seconds after it left my mouth. So, but he treated me absolutely great. Oh, I love it. Uh, it's it's so great when you know you had um, you had all these experiences at the college level, and then you be- get you get to become your own head coach at, at Kent State. Um, what was that experience like, and, and why did you want to to make that jump? And also, something that we've talked about recently is that was a very meaningful time for you in your career. So so can you kind of just take me through those years? Well, the, first off, my I had three bosses in a row. Nick Saban, Gary Pinkle, and Lou Holt. And they were all Kent State graduates. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, uh, and I grew up in the Mid-American Conference. Mm-hmm. Went to school at Bowling Green. I coached as defense coordinator at Miami of Ohio, defense coordinator at Toledo. So I knew the league really well and, and loved the league. It's very competitive. It's not high profile and all that, but right. it's very good football. And just, just I really love the league. So the Kent State job, kind of opened up and they actually contacted me and I think probably because of Nick and Lou and, mm. and Gary and uh, I know there were some people thought maybe I shouldn't take this job because they had lost for a long time and it was not good losses either right. it, was, it was not good but part of the reason it attracted me that job attra- I was attracted to that job was the same thing as high school mm-hmm. One of the, I told you early on, one of the most rewarding things I ever did was having a first winning season in years at that high school. Yeah. And I thought, 
okay, whoever takes over for Nick Saban at Alabama, you got about one way to go, and that's that. I mean, <laughs> right. how, how are you going to you know, fill those shoes? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like when I went to New England, yeah, I won a Super Bowl my first year there, but they won the Super Bowl the year before. Yep. Did I feel a sense of accomplishment? Well, yeah, I didn't screw them up, but I didn't build them. Mm-hmm. Bill Belichick built it. Mm-hmm. So this was an opportunity. Can we take a program that is really down and down, mm-hmm. and let's see if we can change it? And that's such a gratifying, satisfying feeling. It wasn't high school. So I wanted to kind of relive that a little bit yeah. at the college level, and we did. And we turned the thing around with guys like Josh Cribbs and James Harrison and some other guys. It, it took some players. But what a gratifying feeling to finally have the first winning season then in 2001, and we beat Ben Roethlisberger on the last play of the last game to go 6-5. and five. Mm-hmm. And people would have thought we'd won the Super Bowl. What a gratifying feeling that was. And it was hard work. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of money at those schools. You got to really work hard. You're fighting an uphill battle in recruiting, not only financially, but because you've been losing for so long. Right. You know, culture is everything. Are, hey, kids are looking at you. Yeah. Uh, hey, I recruited Dave Ragone. That's on our staff, and it came down to us in Louisville. Yeah. And I know why he went to Louisville. And Louisville was having winning seasons, and we weren't. And he was high-profile quarterback out of Cleveland, Ohio. Mm-hmm. And so. It was just those six years where it was very, very, very gratifying. Yeah. Can you walk me through that uh, recruiting process of Dave Ragone? You know what? Dave Ragone helped me more than any coach or player ever in recruiting. Really? I'll tell you how. And he knows it because I gave him credit for it. (laughs) Dave Ragone was a very high profile St. Ignatius High School, which is a great high school in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. State champions and stuff. So it comes down to us and Louisville. And the thing about Dave was, you know, most recruits or the high school coach is going to tell you and go, hey, he recruit, you know, he committed to Louisville. Yeah. Dave didn't. Dave came down and told me in person, coach, I'm going to Louisville. I really loved it here. I loved my visit here. You know, I like your staff. I like all the stuff, what you're doing, but I'm going to Louisville. Dave, why? Tell, tell me why. Because this would have been a, a coup for us to get right. this guy out of Cleveland. Yeah. He goes, it's just, I've grown up all the time reading the Cleveland Plain Dealer and everything, and everything about Kent State football was negative. You know, Louisville, pretty positive. It's not, it's like everybody would probably stop him in the hallway and say, you know, hey, where are you going to school, Dave? And Dave would go, well, it's between Kent and Louisville. And I'd go, Kent. Mm. You know, so I don't think he could, he, he couldn't overcome that. Like so the reputation. Said, yeah. yeah, and he also wanted to be an NFL player, and so yeah. he thought my chances are going to be better. I was selling to him, come here and help us build something special. Mm. You can be the guy. Mm. So he didn't. Mm. But he told me in person, mm. which tells you a little bit about him as a man and as a young boy, eight, 17, 18 years old, to have, you know, usually they have the coach call you to tell you. So I looked at that, and I go, okay, so this guy loved it here. He was a high-profile guy. He liked his visit. He liked the school. He liked the staff, and he still didn't choose us. What's that tell me? Mm-hmm. So I changed my whole recruiting program wow. and said, I'm going east because we were an Ohio school, and we tried to recruit nothing but Ohio, a lot of Ohio kids, uh-huh. which we still did. But we're fighting Toledo, Miami of Ohio. you got Ohio State. And then everybody else can, comes into Ohio and recruits. Syracuse, all, Penn State, all of them. Mm-hmm. I need to go somewhere where people don't know as much about Kent State football. Ah. So I went to the East Coast. Mm-hmm. And I got a kid named Josh Cribbs and a couple other guys. <laughs> and all of a sudden it turned the whole thing around. Yeah. Then we went back to recruiting Ohio hard once we started winning. Mm-hmm. So it was like... Dave Ragone, by not coming, actually helped me turn the program around because I took a different direction in recruiting. That is fantastic. I, this is the podcast material that I was looking for. I <laughs> love this. It's really great, and I, it's interesting because we've kind of gone through your high school experience, your college experience, and the next time that you pop on the podcast, which this is going to be a separate part, 
we're going to get into you making the jump to the league and, and all of the experiences that come along with it. Maybe hopefully get some Bill Belichick stories in there. Um, <laughs> but thank you for joining me today, and we're really looking forward to having you on in a couple days. My pleasure.